Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and you're listening to Conversations with Joe. Ah, uh, I gotta go. I gotta go lay down now. You got it. Okay. <laughs> In my time doing YouTube, there have been a handful of moments when I had to just kind of pinch myself to make sure that what I was seeing was actually happening. And this interview is now one of them. When it comes to science communicators, it doesn't get much bigger than today's guest. He's so ubiquitous and prolific with books, interviews, shows, podcasts. He's just, he's everywhere. And I felt like his actual accomplishments as a scientist get overlooked. So I decided to start my interview by just kind of going through a long list of accomplishments and awards and such. And uh, being pretty new to the interview format and podcasting and whatnot, I didn't realize that uh, maybe the most awkward thing in the world is talking about someone for a long time while that person is sitting there staring at you, just waiting for you to get on with it. Uh, so I don't really think it landed as well as I wanted, and I doubt that I'll be doing that again. But anyway, live and learn. Uh, but since I put so much effort into giving him an intro during the interview, I'm just going to keep this intro short. So with that, enjoy today's conversation. If you're listening to uh, today's podcast, and you already know who I'm talking to because the name is in the title, but uh, I'm going to give a nice little intro anyway. So today's guest is a graduate of Harvard University, a PhD in astrophysics from Columbia University, holds 20 honorary doctorates, author of 17 books, is a Grammy winner, a Critics' Choice Award winner, an Isaac Asimov Award winner. He's been given the NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal, the Stephen Hawking Medal for Science Communication. Discover Magazine named him one of the 10 most influential people in science. Time Magazine named him one of the most 100 people, 100 most influential people in the world and the sexiest astrophysicist alive. <laughs> you might know him as the director of the Hayden Planetarium and the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He's the host of Star Talk Radio, two seasons of Cosmos on the National Geographic Channel, the man, the myth, the legend, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Well, well, thank you. Is there any time left for the interview? <laughs> no, no, I was just going to keep going. I'm just going to read your Wikipedia page. <laughs> no, no, a few, I, I need to uh, clarify a few things. First, okay. I was nominated for a Grammy, did not win a Grammy. Oh, okay. Okay, and that was for my own narration of the book astrophysics for people in a hurry, which I enjoy doing, and I'm glad people love the book and, and my narration. But I, I lost to, who did I lose to? Was it uh, someone who had like just died? And oh, so well. you never win, you yeah, never you win on those things, that. regardless, okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also, the, the sexiest astrophysicist alive was 40 pounds ago, if you want to <laughs> measure time by body weight. <laughs> Uh, that was People Magazine back in the year 2000, and I'm not entirely sure how competitive that category was, just to be clear. <laughs> uh, on the cover of that issue, because that's the Sexiest Man Alive issue, was oh. Brad Pitt. So he transcends category. Mm. He's on the cover, and they had all these other way more competitive categories than Sexiest Astrophysicist, like Sexiest Action Star, Sexiest News Anchor. Sex, you know, there's some really potent categories in there. Sexiest <laughs> Model. All right, so mm. so they I think they they just needed a, 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 a <laughs> they needed a diversity point among professions. All right, <laughs> let's Fair throw in some kind of science. I don't know. <laughs> but there are many astrophysicists that have not been named sexiest astrophysicists alive. So yeah, I think it was the only time they ever actually had that category. So mm. I think that's now. I'm also curious who the sexiest dead astrophysicist is because they have yeah. Dead, I, I, I don't alive, think that you know. I don't think they they judge. The beauty of dead people. I think that. <laughs> well, so okay, so in your intro, I included that you're the director of Hayden Planetarium because that's how everybody introduces you. No, I'm so hey, to, can uh, I add wait, one last thing about your intro? Uh, just, okay. just to be a pain in your ass, please. Um, I don't like <laughs> intros because it implies you you should listen to this guy because he has this pedigree, rather than just let me say things that convince you in our conversation. And if they don't convince you, my pedigree is not going to matter. Mm -hmm. And if it, my pedigree did matter, then man, you're just accepting what I say mm -hmm. on authority. And that should never happen. Well, let me defend myself, though, because you do so many interviews and have so many media appearances. You're so like ubiquitous that I think people forget that you're actually a very accomplished astrophysicist in your own right. And I wanted to I wanted to give you that credit. OK, oh, that's sweet of you. That's, yeah. <laughs> you know. Okay. When I, once I started looking at them all, I was like, wow, this is 
I'm, I'm actually more impressed than I was before. That's really cool. Okay, and with, the, with the, it's 21 honorary doctorates. So what I want you to be impressed with is not that I have 21 honorary doctorates, but that I sat through 21 graduations. <laughs> <laughs> Do you just have a closet full of sashes? Yeah, it's, it's, on a, it's in my office. It's on yeah. the top shelf. That's so I'm just, I just want the, the, the real courage and sympathy I, for me and sympathy I seek is having sat through uh, 21 graduations where every name gets gets listed and they walk across the stage. That is an ordeal. Yeah. So how many of those would you go to every year if you'd done 21 of them? That's multiple. It's year, one every, I, I, my first one I forgot was in the 90s. So once every um, yeah. one or, you know, one or two a year, something like that. Once one a year. That, but it's, it's just, right if right. only they want me, I mean, it's not, you know, some years were zero, others were two sure. or three. Yeah. So my most recent one was Yale in 1918, and there was nothing in the COVID year. So uh, just, just a, you said 1918 just then. I'm assuming you mean. 20. Oh, did I say 1918? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's going back a ways. Yeah. Oh, ooh, I, 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 my, my, my time machine secret just <laughs> kept, kept. Damn it! <laughs> kept it so quiet this whole time. Um, and one other thing is, um. What's interesting is I, I was chatting once with the head of NASA, and I told him I couldn't stay long because I had to go receive an honorary degree. And I grumbled that you know, you know, an honorary degree is just honorary, right? It's just sort of, it's it's a, it's a gestural thing. He said, "No, don't think of it that way." I said, "Well, why?" He said, "Your original PhD, <clears throat> your original PhD, was given to you on the promise." that you will do something great. Whereas the honorary degree is the evidence that you have. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting way to think about it. So I said, okay, all right, you got me there. Yeah. So, so I do look upon them proudly. I do. You should, you should. I, I think um, if you're anything like me, I, I'm, I kind of fluff off whatever accomplishments I might have had. You know, if somebody were to give me an intro like that, I would have just shrunk and like, ah, oh, stop. But, um, you know, to step back and kind of take an audit of, of what you've been able to do, I think is, is good. Yeah, when I give public talks, I just say, just just welcome to the stage, Neil deGrasse Tyson, that's it. I don't, you know. <laughs> okay. And let me earn whatever, you know, let me earn it in that yeah, moment, yeah. whatever it is you're going to feel for me. Or not. Well, if I ever have you back on, I'll remember that. <laughs> okay. I like well, so it. No, if I, wanna... I ever have you back, there's the test. I <laughs> know uh, exactly. Yeah, get it together, Joe. <laughs> um, so yeah, the Hayden Planetarium thing. I've never been, and I always hear it referenced. And um, I thought I would give you a chance to to talk about it. Like, what what is the Hayden Planetarium? What does your job as director mean? And what does it mean to you? Where did you grow up? Uh, Texas. I've lived my whole life in Texas. What town? Dallas. I'm in Dallas. Dallas now, yeah. yeah, Texas, for the longest while, I don't know how old you are, but Texas, uh, among all states, had like the fewest planetariums per capita. <laughs> and Austin had none. And yeah. the capital, right? And so this was odd because planetariums are not all that expensive to construct and to maintain. And most cities in the United States, most big cities, uh, had one, have mm -hmm. one. So. A planetarium is most people's first encounter with a sort of virtual reality immersion experience. You go in, there's a big comfortable chair, the, you dim the lights, that's when the adults fall asleep, and then the kids... <laughs> <laughs> you can't put a, a tired grown-up in, in a reclining yeah. comfortable chair and turn out the lights. That's They've just not fair. They've been walking to a museum with their kid all day. <laughs> that's just not fair. Yeah. But, uh, so you go in, dim the lights, and then the stars come out, and then the dome disappears because now you're transported. And that first experience occurred with me at the Hayden Planetarium, where I now serve as director. That happened with me, at, I was around age nine, a family trip, and I, I was hooked ever since. By age 11, I realized, hey, I could do this professionally. Mm -hmm. And so I had the answer to that annoying question that adults ask kids. What's that question? Because of that one experience. No, no. What's the question adults, the annoying question? Oh, what do you question? want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? So I get asked that from age 11 on, I said astrophysicist. 
And that pretty much shut him up, you know, because I said, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer. Oh, Aunt Matilda's a doctor or uh, Uncle Louis is a lawyer. Nobody knew any astrophysicists. <laughs> so that was, that was sh it's those like, are short-lived okay. exchanges. Yeah. I don't know anything about that. Good luck. Mm -hmm. so, so I lined my whole life in the service of that love and that interest. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, it, it's awesome that you're getting to run the place that kind of got you excited about it in the first place. Yeah, stories like that play better in small towns, I think. Mm. Um, I tell that to people in New York and they say, yeah, so yeah, and your point is, <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it doesn't trigger amazement. So mm. generally, I don't, you know, I'll mention if, if we're talking about it, but I don't volunteer it. Yeah, that's cool. Well, so um, you got a new book out. And we'll be talking about that here in a second. So I'm sure you're getting asked a, a million different questions about that. I wanted to give you a chance to talk about something that you don't normally get a chance to talk about. Like, are there any... Any uh, rabbit holes you've gone down recently or TV shows you're into, books, whatever, that uh, non-science related that have been getting you excited? Oh, uh, interesting. Non-science related. Or it could be. If well, it's sort of science related. It's sort of. Okay. Um, one of my favorite shows growing up was I Dream a Genie. And, okay. But I've, I'd only saw it in reruns and then you only catch bits and pieces. So I figured, okay. I'm going to binge all five seasons or also how many hell seasons it was. And so I have two episodes left out of all seasons. And I'm realizing how bad the episodes were in the last season. And then, of course, you reminded, that's why that was the last season. <laughs> okay? I mean, there's nothing ever... You know, it's not written in the sky that the last season is going to be a magical set of shows for anything because it was really good. Why not continue it? But I, I reaffirmed what was sort of going on in the background. But um, I was fascinated by how by the, the show went from 1965 to 1970. OK, so that was that was six years. So six yeah. seasons, I think it was. And so fall of 65 to spring of 70. And the that's when we're going to the moon okay right. that we're going from gemini to apollo and uh genie is a genie for an astronaut who found right. th those who don't know about the show he he was marooned on a desert island and he found a genie bottle and he rubbed it and genie comes out mm -hmm. okay and so the first season was in black and white and the rest were in color with the first and second season and uh, and then they, Netflix would later colorize it, okay? So I thought that's, no, you don't do that. Let it yeah. be in the original um, thing. Anyhow, point is, <laughs> there's the entire space race going on in the backdrop. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm enchanted by that. Also by the fact, I mean, little things, little things. We're talking about 1966, 67. If there are ever more than six people in a scene, in a sort of a random scene, one of them is black. And I said, hey, that's progressive in the day. Sure. I mean, just, you know, I'm, I transport myself, and, I, and black men and black women who, who are professionals, who are staffed, who are, um, and uh, Major Nelson, uh, the astronaut who's in the Air Force, and so you have, uh, there's an Air Force sergeant, there's a, so, so I, I, I'm tracking this. So because all shows are just of their day, mm -hmm. and I, are they regressive or progressive in how they are communicating their stories? And so, um, yeah, so, so I've, been, I've, been, I've been enjoying that. Reliving the episodes I remembered and uh, filling in the blanks that I don't. Now, one thing, you are the first person I'm telling this to, just so you know. Cool. Are you ready for this? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Too much pressure. My first book. My first book was inspired by a single episode of I Dream a Genie. The one that the first book you wrote? Yes. Okay. Yes. A, a single episode of I Dream a Genie gave me the idea for this book. Go for okay? it. I want to hear this. You want to hear this. Okay. So the book is called Merlin's Tour of the Universe. Mm hmm. And we're thinking of sort of re-releasing it because it's been 30 years, 
30, uh, 20, yeah, 30, it's been 30 years, so I might update it and bring it out again. I wrote a column for a newsletter at the University of Texas at Austin. That's how I know Austin didn't have it. <laughs> uh, they didn't have a, a planetarium, certainly not while I was there. And um, it was called the McDonald Observatory Newsletter, later to become what was called Stardate. And it was, it was just a monthly update on cosmic happenings and what's in the sky. And there's a question and answer column called Merlin. And I wrote that column. So was that like a pin name or? or... So what? So, so the column predates me, but um, it was just some people write in and then and one of our staff answered it. And then he was tired of it. He said, they've all asked all the good questions. He gave up. I said, how could, how could you think that about this? What? What? So I took it over, okay? And I made Merlin an actual character with a backstory, okay? Cool. And it was before, it was just, it was really just header for uh -huh. just an exchange with, a, with an expert. But I, Merlin had backstory. So Merlin was born in the Andromeda galaxy five billion years ago. Was has studied the formation of our solar system, which began five billion years ago. Was intrigued by the evolutionary trajectories of the third planet from the host star, and tracked all major events. So that when you ask Merlin a question, you say, oh, "Dear Merlin, how how does gravity work?" So Merlin says. I re remember a conversation I had with Isaac Newton in his backyard. Let's rejoin that conversation. So you, okay. could, you could imagine, you could, yeah. Yeah, and so I got to reconstruct historical encounters yeah. between Merlin and anybody important or significant that I needed to bring in to help answer the question. Mm -hmm. And so I read up on the history. How would they speak? Um, what words were common in the 1750s versus the 1680s and so now where did all that come from i'm watching a single episode of i dream a genie and it's her birthday and major nelson she asked major nelson um uh, can i have a birthday party and she he said sure and she said i just like to invite some of my friends and he said sure and he's walking out the door and he's thinking to himself wait a minute she doesn't have any friends because he's the only one who knows she exists, yeah. right? How many so, friends what, are in that bottle? Right. So he comes back and there they are. Cleopatra, King, uh, um, King Tut, uh, Sigmund Freud. Um, uh, who else is there? Uh, so these are her friends and they're these famous people. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I could be that? Uh -huh in my own sort of Q&A construct. And so Merlin's tour of the universe is Merlin knowing anybody that had to be known in order to communicate science to the questioner. And so this binging of I Dream a Genie, no, it doesn't accrue to my science professional career, but it is yeah. a bit of nostalgia for me. And it's affirmation that this can, and I think will continue to be a potent um, uh, uh, vehicle for a, a, a trope or whatever is the right word in storytelling in order to communicate science as effectively as I can. Hi, I'm Joe Scott. You might remember me from the podcast you were just listening to, and I'm here to talk to you about Curiosity Stream. Have you ever found yourself endlessly scrolling through titles on one of your streaming services and you just can't find anything that really gets your brain going? And maybe you thought to yourself, it sure would be neat if there was a streaming platform that only streamed high-quality, mind-blowing documentaries and educational programs from some of the best filmmakers around the world? Have you ever wanted that? If so, you're in luck, because that, my friend, is CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the premier streaming service for documentaries and educational programming with thousands of titles to choose from and everything from history to futurism, science to art, whatever you're interested in, you can find it there. Seriously, the only problem with CuriosityStream is that it's littered with rabbit holes that you can easily get lost in, so be sure to pace yourself. And they're always adding new content, like the series What Went Wrong, that examines some of the biggest disasters and mysteries of the last 50 years, including the Challenger disaster, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, and London's Greenfell Tower fire that killed 72 people in 2017. Oh, and have you ever been watching really great documentary programming and thought to yourself, hey, it sure would be neat if there was something like that for my favorite YouTubers? 
If so, then you're in even more luck because when you sign up for Curiosity Stream, you get free access to Nebula, a streaming service created by some of your favorite YouTubers where you can see their videos ad free and where they can feel free to experiment and try new things without the dreaded algorithm hanging over their heads. I'm on Nebula actually, and it's the only place you can see my Nebula exclusive series, Mysteries of the Human Body, where we delve into the weird and sometimes scary world of unexplained diseases. It's a fun time. There's also original series from Real Engineering, Windover Productions, Legal Eagle, Lindsay Ellis, Minute Body, the list goes on and on. Nebula is like our own little piece of the internet, and you're welcome to join us. And I've been told to brag a little because Nebula has been nominated for a Streamy, the most coveted prize in the history of the world. And the crazy thing is you get both of these streaming services at a ridiculous discount if you sign up at my special link, which is curiositystream.com slash joescottpod. That's curiositystream.com slash j-o-e-s-c-o-t-t-p-o-d. You'll get 26% off the annual rate, bringing the grand total for both of these amazing streaming services to $14.79 for an entire year. So one more time, that's curiositystream.com slash joescottpod, and you can start streaming smarter. And thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this podcast. And now, back to the show. I love I love stuff like that when some insp- like what a random place for inspiration to come from. Completely random. And that kind of set your career on, on, on fire, didn't it? Well, it really not my career. I just, I, it, was, it was just my first book. I mean, I, got I, things yes, started, I do yeah. write and I've written a lot of books, but that's what I do on the side. I'm, like, I'm a scientist down the middle. Yeah. Everything else is are off ramps. Yeah. But that's awesome. That's cool. I, uh, I've gone down. I mean, this is the seventh time you use the word awesome. And I will stop. Or, the, sorry. or maybe the fifth. <laughs> I'm old school. I save awesome for we just landed on the moon. Awesome. Okay. That's okay. how I use the word awesome. See, I just want to pull so rank on you awesome. here. I'm just pulling rank here and saying <laughs> if if you can use awesome five times in this conversation, what word are you gonna save mm. to react to when we first walk on Mars? Okay, so so my little pet peeve word wise is when people use the word decimate. Because I'm okay. like, that means reduced by ten. Yeah. Or ten percent. It's ten percent. As the Romans did when they decimated towns. Yeah. They take every tenth man and publicly kill them to terrorize everyone else in the town. That's mm -hmm. decimate. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, but you can be but you don't want to be like grammar Nazi. Uh, you, you at some point you have to allow words to have changed. And mm -hmm. I, see I used to be like you. I used <laughs> what do you mean used I to was, be? I was once like very you. Very similar. And then I realized I am using words happily and freely that in their day were controversial. Mm -hmm. And so if so, it's just a matter of time. I was born into this new usage and it's just because something changed on my watch that I'm going to get angry about it. Well, it shouldn't have mattered that it changed on my watch or the watch of my parents or my grandparents. It changed. Mm -hmm. Get over it. And so one of those words, for example, here's a word I bet you use freely, uh, such as, um, did you ever use the word workaholic? You've used that. I've used it, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. That is really badly constructed. Okay. Because it's, it's, it comes from the term alcoholic, right? Uh -huh. And alcoholic is someone... No, did I say this? Did I say the right word? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> an alcoholic is someone who's addicted to alcohol. Okay. A workaholic is someone who's addicted to workahol. Because <laughs> 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 the ick is the addiction. So right. the the proper form of that word would be work ick, but um, that never that no one ever put that out there. So I'm just saying, and I have other examples. Here's another one: uh, electrocute. Mm -hmm. Okay, right when we invented electricity, people figured out you could execute criminals with them. So if you execute <laughs> well, with electricity, they call it electrocute. But no, no, because the root, the, 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 the foundational word is execute, right? Mm. So the X is the killing mm. and the cute is the act of killing, execute. If you take away the X, that's the death part of it. And now you put in electrocute, then you're just sending electricity somewhere without any reference to um, taking the life 
of a convicted criminal. So that's another poorly formed word, but it just stuck. So given that we all use those words, I would just lighten up on the people who say decimate. That's all. Yeah, I'm, 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 I've had to, especially in the comments of the YouTube channel, just like stop correcting people's use of your versus you are and all that, because it's just. Uh, well, that's just, just ignorance. <laughs> You just don't, I know, well, you just don't come off. I don't want to it. think of that as an evolution of the usage of a word. That's just they messed up. Okay. Yeah. I got to <laughs> okay, draw lines. I'm somewhere. actually glad you're with me on that then. Because there, there's I'm a with line you on the you're and the you're for sure. Yeah. Um, quantum leap is a term that always bugs me too, the way people use it. They're like, it, it's been a quantum leap in our understanding. Yeah. Like, I, but that's. Yeah. So I'm, I, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm letting that one go. I was initially resistant to it. So uh, just to fill people in who may already know, but since I'm here, <laughs> uh, a quantum leap is a really tiny change in the energy levels of an atom. Yeah. It's, 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 it's infinitesimally tiny. It's quantum. So you say there's a quantum leap, you're not really, and you're referencing quantum physics, you're talking about a very small change, but that's usually not how you mean it. Yeah. And so the, if you're going to use it in a way that doesn't apply to atoms, then the application of the term quantum leap should reference that it happened basically instantaneously. Okay. A quantum leap happened like overnight. That would be a fair usage of it, but it shouldn't be measuring the, the, the scale of that change. But I think that that's been lost. Another one, since we're on the subject, <laughs> is nano. Mm -hmm. but you know what a na nano is the metric prefix for a billionth of something. Right. Okay. So a nanometer is a billionth of a meter, which is a millionth of a millimeter. That is small. People talk about nanobots as just being small robots that you still pick up and hold in your hand. There's nothing nano about it. I guess, I guess it's one billionth the size of a robot that's a billion times bigger, but that's not a real thing. So people have loosely used nano to mean anything small. Mm. and completely obliterating the metric precision that it had offered from the start. Yeah, yeah. I guess micro kind of gets used the same way. Yeah, but micro, you know, a microscope, it loosened up the precise meaning of micro. Yeah. And the microscope was invented uh, before we had the metric system. Sure. So I think micro, uh, I'm okay with micro just being anything small. Mm. Well, so uh, a little rabbit hole I've gone down lately. Uh, people on my channel know what I'm talking about. I, I kind of went down a Victorian era rabbit hole. I just became fascinated by anything Victorian for some reason. Um, and I made an argument. I would love to hear your take on this, that I feel like sometimes the world changed more fundamentally in terms of like how we live our lives in the 1800s than it did in the 1900s in terms of our understanding of, of the universe and the discoveries we made and the technology that was created and stuff. Um, what's, what's your opinion on that? So I am in the middle of writing about that. Oh, so I, okay. I have very fresh thoughts. Cool. Please. And, but I can't tell you about the project cause it's, it's, it's next year. You know, nobody's gonna hear about it until next year. Um, I picked an interval of time that I thought what's, cause I got on a binge talking about the exponential growth of science and technology. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I thought to myself, has that manifested in any way? I can see it in published journals and this sort of thing, but has it touched civilization in any way that people can sort of follow along? And I've concluded that indeed, yes, it has. Just take a 30 year increment and let's start in the year 1870, okay? Sure. Um, 1870, you know, railroads had kind of just begun. You know, they were around for sure. Um, they didn't quite move, they weren't quite moving as fast as they would a little later, but th th you had that, okay? Uh, some people had some balloons, you know, mm -hmm. that was about it. The telegraph had come along. Um, the, okay. Mm -hmm. So what happens in the next 30 years? Within the next 30 years, up until 1900, um, the telephone is invented, airships are perfected, steamships mm -hmm. go fast across the oceans, uh, railroads completely cross the continents. 
the automobile is invented, the internal combustion engine, the uh, uh, industry making huge machines that uh, bridges, uh, uh, suspension bridges, the, 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 the uh, Brooklyn Bridge, for goodness sake. All of this happens in that 30 year period, okay? Living in the year 1900 would be unrecognizable to anyone in the year 1870. Right. All right. I have a quote from the year 1900, and this could have been you. In fact, maybe it was you. I don't know how old you are. The quote from one of the directors of the New York Central Railroad in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in a special issue wondering what the next hundred years will bring. It was a Sunday edition of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in the year 1900. I think it was on New Year's Eve. And so in the, you pull out this section and people are imagining. And this fellow, who's connected to railroads, he said, we can scarcely Im imagine that transportation in the 20th century will be as great as it was in the 19th century. Because he was riding high on all the modes of transportation I just listed for you. He had no idea that three years later we'd invent the freaking airplane. Okay, no concept of that. Yeah. All right, what 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 else? He, he he can't picture that in that thirty years we would go from the invention of the airplane and people thinking it's just a novelty one-off to flying the airplane across the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lindbergh. All that happened in those thirty years. Or oh, what else happened? You can no longer give away a horse because transportation on roads has now been replaced by cars. Mm -hmm. You take a picture from 1900 to 1930 of any downtown of any city, it goes from all horses to all cars. Right. All right. Um, you still had airships, fine. Um, uh, dirigibles at that point, okay. Well, keep going, that's fine. Oh, oh, what else happened that 30 years? We had a, a world war that killed 20, 30 million people and a pandemic that killed another 30 million people. Oh, that just happened in that 30 years, by the way. Okay. Oh, oh, I forgot. Oh, there's also a depression. Excuse me. 1929. 1930 would be unrecognizable to anyone from 1900. Now we go from 1930 to 1960. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> uh, what happens? We break the sound barrier. We go from, from we just barely making it across the Atlantic Ocean in an airplane to breaking the sound barrier. Jets are invented. Okay? Uh, what else? Oh, oh, excuse me. Uh, we launch a satellite to orbit the Earth going 18,000 miles an hour. Oh, my gosh. Oh, nuclear weapons are invented. Oh, my gosh. Holy crap. Oh, and by the way, a world war is fought fit killing 50 million people. Again. At a rate of 1,000 people per hour for every hour that war was fought. Life in 1960 would be unrecognizable to anyone in 1930. And I'm going to stop there, but you get my point. Because mm -hmm. if I go from 1930 to 1990, I mean 1960 to 1990, another 30 years, what happens? Everybody has a computer on their desk. Oh my gosh. In 1960, the only computers were used by the military and by scientists, and they were the size of a room. Mm -hmm. Okay? So now everyone has one on their desk. On their desk. Um, the internet is invented. People still trying to figure out what to do with it yet, but the internet exists. Okay? And the World Wide Web. And, but we're still, we're still in the infancy there. Fine. Oh, oh, by the way, over that time, we sent nine missions, 27 astronauts to the moon. Life in 1990 would be unrecognizable to anyone in the year 1960. Now we go from 1990 to today, 30 years. Now, now you're carrying a computer on your hip that's more powerful than any computer that was running around town in the year 1990. Oh my gosh. And what else? There's social media. Everyone's talking to everybody at all times. We have, we have spacecraft that have landed on comets, landed on asteroids, wrote helicopters on, on, on Mars. Don't tell me things aren't changing. Mm. They're changing whether you realize it or not. It's because you are changing with it. Right.
And so when you're changing with it, it's the frog in the boiling in the heated water. You just don't even know. Just take a look back. You would find living completely annoying, frustrating, and damn near impossible if I transported you back to 1990. Yeah, it's true. I can summon a car service using satellites, okay? <laughs> you can find a mate within a hundred paces using satellites on a computer that you walk around with on your hip. Don't tell me things aren't changing. Reach. I need a mic to drop here. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, do I, do I cut in? Is he still going? <laughs> okay. Wait, well, you got to give, give some calm. Okay. Yeah, let okay. Go. Now cut it. Okay. Um, no, the, one of my favorite things is to look back. Do you remember the AT&T you will campaign from like the early nineties? Does Maybe. that ring a bell at all? Well, no. AT&T had a campaign that was, they called it the you will campaign. And it, it, it was like, have you ever paid a toll without stopping? Oh, oh, you will. Okay. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that. You will. Uh -huh. And the company that'll bring it to you all that. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And one of them is, um, uh, have you ever sent a fax from the beach? Yeah. <laughs> you will. It's like, <laughs> it's actually, no, no, so not yeah. only did I ever want to, nor would I ever want to, nor did anyone ever <laughs> care to. And no, we do. We, we, yeah. we, so even they could not imagine the future that would overtake their most futuristic ads. Mm hmm. And this was the company that kind of helped make all these changes happen, but they well, so they Bell, didn't see Bell Laboratories, especially. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, but like a branch of AT and T. Yeah. It was it was funny to me how they got some things really close to right, but just the way that they saw it happening was just totally different. Like you know, what happens is you get you get near term things right because you're just extrapolating. Yeah. But you don't see things coming in from left field. You just mm -hmm. have no idea, and that completely transforms things. Yeah. Oh, by the way, one, just from 1960 to 1990, um, <laughs> if you took a potato, put it in this box, closed the door, and six minutes later it's fully baked, that anyone from 1960 would report you to the witch. Yeah. <laughs> to <Yeah>. the, <laughs> they try to resurrect the witch burning laws. How did you heat that potato? <laughs> Um, so, invisible waves that you can't invisible, see. Wait, but are they heat waves? No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so take for example, just while we're there, mm -hmm. uh, Back to the Future Two, <laughs> which is where he goes into the future. That was filmed in 1989, so let's call it 1990, and it was, um, it took place in the in way in the year 2015. 2015, yeah. So, of course, they had flying cars. Right, we're never going to get flying cars, but you got to have those because mm -hmm. it's not a future movie without it. And don't ask me about the hoverboard because I have strong opinions about it. But <laughs> only if you care, I'd be happy to comment on it. But the point, it. one thing to notice is, I don't know if you remember the storyline, but he irritated, angered his boss, and he got fired. The, do you remember how the, he learned that he got fired? I do. Okay, so what happens is they send a fax to him at home and it just says you're fired in that dot matrix printer it's on a dot matrix printer but but since this is the future and he has a future home he doesn't just have one fax machine he has three fax machines <laughs> so <laughs> it comes out in different rooms so so that is the future in the year 2015 three fax machines instead of in, one in double ties Double, oh, the double tie. I thought that was cute. That was cute. <laughs> I'm still waiting tie. for that to happen. I've been waiting. Still waiting for that. Yeah. Um, it, it still cracks me up that that was six years ago now, what they had expected. or what they Yeah, I made a whole list. I wonder if I published it. A list of every futuristic thing and how we did against it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another one. They have a precision weather forecast. And we do pretty well now. You know, on your app, it'll tell you when it's going to start raining exactly where you're standing and then when it's going to end, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the the Doc Brown precision weather. But he, it was like sunny and then downpour a few seconds later. That's not real. But right, he was like, yeah, it's going to be raining in five seconds. What are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, so, so you're talking about specifically Back to the Future Part Two, what they got right and what they got. Oh, right. specifically, yeah, they had um, fingerprint locks. We have that now. Mm. That's fine. Yeah. Um, and by the way, the hoverboard. Can, can I talk about the hoverboard? Please, no. You seem... Okay. <laughs> uh, I was originally angered by them calling this motorized skateboard a hoverboard. I said that is that is an abomination. Just uh, call it something else. Mm. Then I realized the hoverboard of Back to the Future doesn't work any more than two or three inches off the ground. Like any other skateboard. So a hoverboard offers nothing over a skateboard. Then what the hell is the point? It's novel, I suppose. Yeah. And it looked like the hoverboard might have had a little bit of energy of its own as do the electric hoverboards that, you know, they banned from airplanes because they had lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm just saying I was hard on the, on the modern hoverboards, harder than I should have been. When I reflected on it, I would say, fine, you're doing exactly what Marty did on his hoverboard. And yeah, you're connected to the ground, but so what? What's the difference? Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Plus, in both cases, they don't work on water. So we're good here. I always wondered, though, if you could do like a superconducting magnetic kind of thing and just float over like a you would only want to do that to reduce friction right and but if it's motorized you know who cares yeah right so electronic uh, rail uh, they have uh, maglev trains in china mm -hmm. we don't have them here i was in this shanghai airport and you know it's an international airport so a lot of signs are are symbols right the symbol for the bathroom the symbol for dining yeah. You know, the symbol for... So there I'm looking up at, and, and there's a symbol for these very prosaic things like shopping and food. And then there's maglev, okay? There's... <laughs> this way, the bathrooms and maglev, okay? The magnetically levitated train to get you from the airport to downtown Shanghai. Oh, okay. You know, going hundreds of miles an hour on a cushion of air suspended by electromagnetic forces. For a second, I thought you were going to say that the, the bathroom had a maglev system in it. No. <laughs> that's, what I thought, that's what I thought you were going. I was like, wow. <clears throat> Some interesting toilets. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it magnetically withdraws its human waste out of <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what that would be. Right. Yikes. Um, well, so you're kind of famous for correcting films, uh, inaccuracies in films on, on Twitter and whatnot. What, what do you consider to be the, the most scientifically accurate film or, or a film that you saw that was like, they got that right? So, I mean, I think I'm deeply misunderstood <laughs> when I embark on these adventures. Mm. So, first of all, it is my objective not to be a pain in your ass sure. and annoy you while you're trying to watch the film. It's to highlight for you something that may give you deeper insight into the storytelling, mm -hmm. okay? And, or alert you of the fact that had they paid a little more attention to the science, they could have told a better story. Yeah. So often the artist says, I need some freedom here, otherwise, uh, well, if you knew more science, maybe the freedom you seek is even greater than what you think you're not getting. Mm -hmm. And so I'll give an example. Star Wars, Force Awakens, the Death Star. It has a new energy source. You know what that energy source is? The star, right? It sucks energy out of a star. Right. Okay, fine. I don't have a problem. It's the future. It's sci-fi. I don't have a problem with that. I would just note that if you take all the energy that's in a star and put it in something else, that something else becomes a star. Just that's how energy works. But let's assume they found some modern futuristic containment device fine now they take that and they don't just destroy one planet they can destroy an entire star system worth of planet this is a badass weapon mm -hmm. okay excuse me did you calculate how much energy is in a star because if you did you'd realize that the death star could then kill a thousand planets not just six or seven at a time. You could just take out a whole sector. And so, so they could have so magnified the power of the dark side if they calculated how much energy is in a star. And they didn't. 
So for me, it's a lost opportunity. Yeah, and I called it out. Mm-hmm. It doesn't That's what I, I think, do. I think it's a good jumping off point for like teaching people things that uh, that maybe they weren't aware That's of. That's also why I do it. And then I'll tell you something else. If you're a car expert and you're watching a period piece from the 50s, right? And somebody says, uh, and it takes place in like 1956, let's say. And you're looking at the scene and there's a 1958 Chevy parked. You're going to say, wait a minute, that's not right. They messed that up. Mm-hmm. And you turn to that person, hey, you know your cars. Hey, that person would be praised by all around them. Uh, if you, Let's say you're a costume designer and you're looking at some period piece of, you know, for a Jane Austen, right? And someone disembarks from a carriage and they and they're wearing a top hat instead of a derby or whatever you know I, 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 what, just pick that right yeah. and they say nope that was not in style over that period that not top hats came 30 years after that you'd be impressed so mm-hmm. wow you know your costume design whereas i sit up straight and i say you know that wouldn't have happened that way they say it's just a movie get over it it's like <laughs> all i ask that's what i'm saying all i ask is to gain the same respect you'd give others who carry expertise into a film. That's all I'm asking. I don't think that's too much. I don't think that's too much. I don't think I'm asking too much of you. No, no. Um, most accurate film, two, two most accurate films are, uh, you know, first run films. I would say Contact, mm-hmm. uh, The Asteroid Strike, um, based on a Carl Sagan novel. And of course, The Martian. No question about mm-hmm. it. There's one really bad flaw in it but if you didn't allow that flaw there would be no movie so yeah. i got to give it to him and i mentioned that to andy weir the the novelist the, uh-huh. he's an engineer turned storyteller novelist and he handed me one of the highest compliments i've ever gotten oh, he yeah? said while he was writing um he imagined that i was looking over his shoulder because <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want anything he wrote to show up later in one of my tweets so he (laughs) doubled down (laughs) yes so as a result it it was it was a really scientifically tight Mm -hmm. and engineeringly tight story so tight it was that i declare that science was itself a character in that film it's true yeah i actually interviewed andy on tuesday excellent oh he's got his, his, his other book is out yeah. Oh, Hail Mary, yes. Yeah, that's what we talked about that quite a bit. Yeah, Have you yeah, had, had a chance to read it? Uh, no, I haven't, but I've, I've, I've been briefed on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's yeah, it's a bi- bi- biological drama. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Space biology drama, yes. It, it's awesome. Kidding. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> he had to do it. Had to do it. Um. Well, so I wanted to ask as a, as a science communicator, we're kind of coming up on, on time here, but um, uh, I feel like it's a weird time to be a science communicator because, you know, technology is progressing and science is progressing so much. You know, we got James Webb coming up. I would love to hear what your thoughts are on, on that. The James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb Space here. Telescope. Uh, too many solar James stations. Webb is not his next guest. Right. <laughs> we have James Webb weird. coming up. Okay, let's hurry up because right. James Webb is waiting in the green room. <laughs> That's spooky. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, I kind of feel like we're regressing in some ways as a society, science wise. I mean, vaccines were never controversial before. And, and now, like, they're this controversial thing. And I was just kind of wondering what your, what, your, what your take is on that as somebody who's been doing it for quite some time. Can that be frustrating? Um, do you feel so like I, maybe I don't, it's hyper? I, I don't have a fully baked answer, okay. but I have two half-baked answers, okay? okay? First one is maybe without all of us on this landscape, I'm just one of many, I count yourself among us, maybe without us, it would have been worse, okay? So while it's easy to say this is having no effect, let's just give up, um, we didn't do the experiment of none of us having existed at all to see how much worse it might have turned out. So that's my first comment. Second, maybe there aren't more. It's just that social media and the internet enabled them all to find each other. So now they speak with a unified common voice, whereas previously it was fragmented, lone person in a group. 
So it feels like there's more of them, but maybe there's not more of them. And so right now, is it three fourths, somewhere around there, of Americans have been vaccinated? Oh, is right. that high? Yeah, I think it, it's 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 gotten somewhere. It's around there, plus okay, or minus. Okay. That's pretty high. Yeah, yeah, it's surprising. You know, that's that that's pretty high. So, um, yes, it is true that there was a day where vaccines were viewed as the savior of civilization in the face of of, t of timeless diseases that had taken their toll of on humanity since the beginning of things, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so that, by the way, while that was happening, we were going to the moon. You know, there was some very, there was some spectacular science achievements going on, science and engineering achievements going on. Um, we 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 knew that physicists won the war with a bomb. That was all physics, okay. And so there was a, a consciousness about this. The Cold War also made everybody. At, you know, stand at attention for what role science and technology would play to protect us from these godless communists, right? So there were a lot of geopolitical forces operating mm -hmm. that, at the time that have no counterpart today. And the anti-vax movement, interestingly, you know, that movement was birthed in the liberal left. You know, they, they were the first anti-vaxxers because they were anti-pharma and they really, really believed the singular claim that it caused autism in spite of the hundreds of research papers that said no yeah. they cherry picked the one that did and and how do you get around that if you have a child who developed autism right um in some proximal time for when they got the shot mm -hmm. so because that autism manifests around that same time mm -hmm. um our evidence shows point is so, so that's hard. That's hard. But I mean, it was the liberal left that started it. Mm -hmm. Then we have the Trump right wingers, where freedom. By the way, Trump eventually told everyone to get a vaccine. So that's underreported in the media, by the way. But but initially, there's this the freedom movement. You can't tell me what to do. Don't tread on me. Ba -de -da -de -da. And so so now, and I'm not gonna wear a mask. You can't make me wear a mask. Okay. And. Uh, of course, uh, Ku Klux Klan always wore masks. They, there was no trouble <laughs> and no complaints Very wearing masks. masks. When you're going to be a Klan member, right? <clears throat> so, 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 point is, you have the liberal left and the conservative right meeting around the other side of the fence, right. yeah, choosing to not be vaccinated and perhaps not even wear a mask. And so, so that's an interesting political development in the last. In, in, in the last year, mm -hmm. the last two years, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about this book you got coming out. Um, if I have it pulled up correctly, it's the Welcome to the Universe in 3D, a visual tour. It's a brief welcome. To, oh, no, so, okay. So, um, you're a step ahead there. They okay. might have given you the future <laughs> link instead of the present link. Okay. Oh, I time so, traveled. I'm sorry. The way this started was okay. the... Uh, I have two colleagues of mine, Richard, uh, um, Michael Strauss and uh, Richard Gott the mm -hmm. Uh These are two colleagues of mine at Princeton, and the three of us co-taught a course, an introductory astrophysics course. And none of us really wanted to teach the class because we, we wanted to do other things, but we said, oh, if we three of us teach it, we only have to teach a third of it, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So that's the first part. Second, we'd said, I, I only want to teach what I'm interested in. So we said, let's throw away the traditional syllabus and just teach what we think is fun and interesting. And that's what we did. And the course went from like 40 people to like 300 people after just a couple of years. You had to change rooms twice. Uh -huh. And so people really liked the class. We enjoyed teaching it. And we said, let's write a textbook. So we wrote a textbook, which is very conversational. It has a lot of the personality that we brought into the classroom, the teaching style. It's all in the textbook. Mm -hmm. So it's like a reader's textbook, not a studier's textbook. All right. Then we created a problem book to go along with it, in case you wanted to teach that class just with it. Then Princeton Press said, um, why don't we make a pocket-sized version of this? And we said, okay, because people don't want to walk around with a big old heavy textbook, so we made 
a brief welcome, the title of it was a welcome to the universe, a brief welcome to the universe, <laughs> a pocket sized story, and it'll fit in the palm of your hand. Uh -huh. Okay, easily in anybody's pocketbook if anyone still carries them. Certainly in your back jeans pocket. And so that just came out just a few weeks ago. Okay. And we're very proud of that because it's we not only taught a course that was our favorite stuff, this is a brief version of that that's our favorite stuff of the favorite stuff. And is, so it is, is there hand anything, any of the favorite stuff you can talk about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's the multiverse is in there. I, we put in a chapter on Pluto because there's still some people yeah. who haven't gotten over it. Yeah. And so I just had lay that out for you. You know, just just I try to be kind and try <laughs> to be gentle. <laughs> we have such an emotional attachment. to. Pluto. I know. I know. OK, so now in the spring, the the photographic 3D version of that book comes out. And it's That's called Welcome to the Universe okay. in 3D. And mm -hmm. so we have all the photos and we got the, 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 the eyeglasses to see the, the, the stereoscopic photos. And everything we talk about is manifested in brilliant photography um, from telescopes on Earth and in the sky. Mm -hmm. So that's not until the spring. So that's the link you had. Is that right? That's what I was given, yeah. <laughs> that's what the one you have. Oh, it right. says right there, published April 19th, 2022. Okay, I see that now. Yeah, you see that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So next April. Yeah, next April. I, I like how it has a little a nose hole so you don't get your your greasy nose all over the page. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I like so it. uh, it's, it's just different ways we're trying to bring the universe down to Earth. Mm -hmm. And the pocket size tour, I, I think, is just fun. Now, of course, you know, I co-wrote it, so what else would I say about it? But even if I weren't that. me, I, th I would say, and I wasn't like the author, co-author of it, I'd, uh, I'd say it's fun. And you, you can dip into it while you're, you know, waiting for the bus because it's that mm -hmm. small and it's that convenient. Cool. Um, I wanted to ask one more thing. I want, I, want to, I want to give you a chance to end on a deep note. How does that sound? This is your show. So we go. <laughs> okay, so. You um, do what you got to do. When I, on my channel, I do some comedy. I do, you know, talk science stuff. And there's always a thread of existential dread in it. That's just kind of like the thing that I add, because for some reason, that's where my brain goes when I start talking about the vastness of space and deep time and all that kind of stuff. You know, the, the idea that uh, our whole species someday will not be here and our planet will someday be eaten alive by the sun and all that kind of stuff. So um, yes, have a nice you, day. Yes, have a nice day. Um, <laughs> How do you, as somebody who kind of lives in that world and, and thinks in, in those ways, like how do you contextualize that in your head to make it not so dreadful? But how, 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 how have you been able to frame it so that it gives you some positivity and maybe, maybe hope in your life? It is, it, is, it is all dreadful. There's no putting a positive spin <laughs> on earth vaporizing, <laughs> earth being vaporized by the dying sun. Mm. There's no, uh, there's no, I can't, I, there's no positive spin. Um, the extinction of our species, the average mammal species lives a, a million years, a couple million years. We're early in that life expectancy of our species. So there's some hope. Maybe we can beat the odds that other mammal species have confronted. Or maybe our intelligence, or what we define as our own intelligence, is such that we are... We are so smart, we've figured out, out a way to kill ourselves so that maybe we will not live out the full expectation, the full life expectation of our, our species. So where's the silver lining for me? Knowing that Earth is going to die, that the universe is going to die, that I'm going to die, knowing this magnifies the meaning of every day, day I'm alive. I wake up in the morning, it's like, what am I gonna discover today? What am I gonna learn today? What am I gonna teach others today? Without the urgency of time brought about by death, why would anyone even get out of bed in the morning? You could always get out of bed tomorrow because there will always be a tomorrow. It reminds me of when you bring flowers to a loved one. You show up at the door with flowers and they 
retrieve the flowers from you, they thank you, they know immediately what to do with it to put it in a vase with water. But then they learn that they're plastic. You've basically insulted the person. Even though the plastic will live forever, we have this unwritten pact between us, among us, that when you give someone flowers, they're intended to be cherished in the moment because we all know they're going to die. They're going to die in real time. If not by tomorrow, in like two or three days. So that forces you to focus your love, your affection, your attention for what is going on here and now. So for me, the demise of the universe and the demise of my organism called Neil deGrasse Tyson is the very force that gives meaning to my life. There you go. I don't know let's, what else let's breathe. I was, I was kind of let that sit for a minute. Let's, let's sit for a moment. Okay. No, I, I think that's that's a great place, Dan. And 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 you know what you you uh, you talked about that a little bit in in the cosmos. I seem to remember, and I I always really like that. Um, it's it's funny how science can kind of bring out a little bit of the, for lack of a better word, a spirituality out of it out of you. You know, it's like a cosmic that, perspective. Cosmic perspective. That's, that's right. What it brings out every time. Well, uh, Doctor Tyson. Dr. Neil to you. Dr. Neil. Uh, <laughs> no, dude, I really do appreciate Neil. this. I can just call you Neil? You just, after that beginning where I told you I don't want introductions, <laughs> yes, of course, just Neil. All right. Well, Neil, I really do appreciate this. It's been a true pleasure. Um, and uh, keep doing well, what you're keep doing. Keep it going. You got a fun you. podcast. Uh, oh, thank you. Keep it going. Yeah. And, and uh, give me the full name of your podcast. It's Joe... What, what is the full well, name? The YouTube channel is Answers with Joe. That's what I call the YouTube channel. The podcast, Answer. this is a brand new thing. So you are literally my second guest. I had Andy and then there's you and, and I'm going to kind of try to keep this. What are you calling this? Sense. I'm calling this right now Conversations with Joe. Okay. Instead of Answers with Joe. Okay. How about, so I'll give you, delighted to give you a Conversations with Joe announcement. You ready? Okay. Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and you're listening to Conversations with Joe. Ah, uh, I gotta go. I gotta go lay down now. You got it. Okay. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> Neil, All right. I appreciate you so much. Uh, so keep that going. I, I, I you too. Good. <laughs> All right. All right. Take care. Have a good. So that happened. There was obviously a lot more I wanted to talk about, um, but I wanted to be respectful this time. Uh, but I really enjoyed that. And if you're just listening to this, it's probably for the better because I just had a big stupid grin on my face the whole time. It's not every day you get to meet somebody who's such a titan in your field. And I just really appreciate him taking the time to do it. So yeah, go check out the book, buy it for any nerd friends for Christmas or whatever. It's called Welcome to the Universe. This is the pocket version, I believe. I'm sure the not pocket version is great too. Uh, but that's it for today. Thanks again to Neil deGrasse Tyson for taking the time to chat with me and for just being the ambassador of science that he is. Uh, we need more guys like that. So that'll do it. I hope you enjoyed this. I've got another one coming your way in a couple of weeks. Um, subscribe in your favorite podcast player to catch that one. And I'm still accepting submissions for our musical intro. So you can hit me up at Answers with Joe at all the socials or email me at AnswersWithJoe.com. Uh, again, thanks for listening. And until next time, keep being awesome. I'm still trying out closing lines too. So we'll see how that one lands.